This is the story behind the electronics equipment that makes it possible for the Air Force's jet interceptors to seek out an enemy bomber day or night, despite the weather, and to attack and destroy the bomber without even seeing it long before it reaches our centers of population. Thus, it is the story behind our first line of defense against the airborne H-bomb. Also, it is the story of how to develop and build this equipment for the Air Force, a small aircraft company grew into one of the nation's largest electronics producers, the Hughes Aircraft Company of today. The story begins in 1935 with a famous airplane, the H-1, in which Howard Hughes set the world's land plane speed record and a transcontinental record, which stood for nearly a decade. This, incidentally, was a plane whose influence may be seen in every airplane that flies today. In 1935, it was the first plane to have a smooth metal skin, the first to employ jet thrust exhaust, power-driven retractable landing gear, bell cowlings, and several other innovations that are now commonplace. ...overshadowed by the company's aircraft projects, the XF-11 photographic reconnaissance plane and the XH-47 saw the first post-war development of the still small Hughes Electronics Department, an airline radar which would warn a pilot when his aircraft approached a dangerous obstacle. Then, in 1948, the small and relatively inexperienced Hughes Aircraft Company entered a bid in competition with the nation's largest electronics manufacturers for the development of an electronic system for the Air Force's brand new jet interceptors. This system was urgently needed. The striking ranges of strategic bombers had increased alarmingly. For the first time in history, the United States was subject to large-scale bombing raids, like those that devastated London and Berlin during World War II. Moreover, modern bombers could be expected to take every advantage of the cover of darkness and adverse weather. The electronic system which the Air Force needed for its new interceptors had to be able to detect a bomber at long ranges by radar and to direct the interceptor on an attack course for firing on and destroying its unseen target. Of all the highly competitive bidders, the Hughes Aircraft Company was the only one which said it could develop and build a flight model of the system in a year. Other companies said it would take at least double that time. To the surprise of the electronics industry, Hughes won the contract. However, five months after the contract was signed, the international situation became more critical. The company received a letter from the Air Force asking in substance, in view of the present military crisis, how fast can you get your system into volume production? Can you give us a flight test in four months, a prototype system three months later, and production in another three months? This was the moment for decisions. The major problems were these. First, did the company's engineers dare to cut three months off original contract deadlines? Second, would Howard Hughes agree to put up the millions of dollars necessary to build and expand plant facilities, to buy extensive new machinery and equipment? And third, did the company dare promise not only a very early flight test date, but large-scale production of these extremely complex electronic systems? In each case, the decision was yes. The following months were tense. Problem after problem had to be solved in this new field of aviation electronics as deadlines loomed. But the flight test schedule was met and the production schedule was beaten by two full days. Then, a few months later... Your attention, please. Today, at the Air Force Proving Ground at Eglin Field, an F-94 jet interceptor equipped with the new Hughes electronic system shot down a drone target on an attack made entirely by radar. Here is the system which the company developed. And here are the airplanes into which it went. Early models of the F-89, and F-94 interceptors. Since those tense days in 1948, 
The Hughes Aircraft Company has developed and manufactured the electronic system for every all-weather interceptor of the United States and Canadian Air Forces. The F-86D Sabre. The F-89D Scorpion. The F-94C Starfire. The Canadian CF-100 Mark III and Mark IV. And for the United States Navy's F-2H-4. And F-3H-2N. The electronic systems that have been developed for the newer interceptors bear little resemblance to that first system of 1948. Before seeing what they're like, however, let's take a look at the evolution of the all-weather interceptor and at the problems of shooting down an enemy plane. Back in World War I, a pilot used a ring and bead sight to train his fixed guns on an enemy plane. Then in World War II, an optical sight was developed which permitted the pilot to move his head without destroying the accuracy of his sighting. Later, a computing gun sight helped the pilot calculate the amount to lead his target. The development of radar made practical the night fighter of World War II, for radar could find the target and assist the pilot in closing on the enemy to attack range. From the night fighter, the all-weather interceptor was developed. Like the fighters that preceded them, the first all-weather interceptors of our Air Force were equipped with fixed guns. But for interceptor use, fixed guns have serious drawbacks. An interceptor's guns must be trained on a bomber for a considerable time in order to damage it critically. To accomplish this, the interceptor must fly a curved course that draws it into the bomber's tail. The tail guns of a modern bomber, however, are so deadly that the interceptor has little chance of surviving long enough to shoot down the bomber. By 1949, a potent new interceptor armament had been developed, air-to-air -air rockets. One rocket contains enough high explosive to knock down a bomber and a salvo of rockets can be fired in a fraction of a second. Thus, a rocket-carrying interceptor need be in a firing position for only an instant. This means that it can attack on a straight-line course from the side, forcing the bomber to fire into a terrific crosswind at a difficult target. These handicaps are so severe that the rocket-firing interceptor attacking from the side is almost entirely safe from the bomber's guns. Let's take a look at what the electronic system for a modern rocket-bearing interceptor does. The system for the F-86D, for example, performs three jobs. First, it locates the target at long ranges, day or night, and in any kind of weather. Second, it automatically flies the interceptor on a straight-line attack course. Third, it automatically fires the interceptor's rockets at precisely the right time to strike the target. The electronic system for the F-86D, basically, is made up of a radar and radar scope, a computer, and a control surface tie-in. The radar serves as the eyes of the system. It sends out, through its antenna, radio frequency energy which is reflected by any object in its path. The reflected energy is received by the radar and sent to the scope, where it appears as a spot of light called a blip. The location of the blip tells the direction and range of the object. As the interceptor flies out to meet its target, the antenna automatically scans the region ahead and the locations of all objects within the radar's range are indicated on the scope, shown here on the right. When the pilot locates his target, he stops this scanning, manually locks the radar on the target, and the attack begins. The radar now tracks the target and furnishes the computer with the target's position and velocity relative to the interceptor. From these, 
the computer continuously calculates the steering corrections that must be made to put the interceptor on a straight line course for attacking the target. Electrical signals calling for these steering corrections go to the control surface tie-in equipment which automatically moves the aircraft's control surfaces so as to put the interceptor precisely on the computed course. So that the pilot can see the correct time, the computer automatically fires the rockets and a big X and that he must take over and fly manually. Now that we have seen what the electronic system does, let's see how the mission of the all-weather interceptor would be carried out. This is one of the bases of our Air Defense Command. It is manned by an all-weather interceptor squadron whose code name is Overtone. Well, here we are. These are the pilots. And this is the ground crew. If attack should come, this is what would happen. Today, the Hughes Aircraft Company, developer and manufacturer of the electronic system whose operation you have just watched, is one of the largest producers of airborne military electronics equipment in the United States. Its people and facilities occupy 72 acres of floor space. In its manufacturing areas, more than 8,000 interceptor electronic systems have been produced, each with as many as 17,000 separate parts. To design new and more advanced electronic systems for the interceptors of the future, the company's research and development divisions have grown till they now employ more than 5,000 people, some 2,000 of whom are scientists and engineers. More than 100 of these are PhDs, and more than 600 have master's degrees. These people, skilled in such fields as microwaves, antennas, miniaturization, semiconductors, electron tubes, and digital computers, are developing considerably more advanced electronic systems than the ones we have just seen. Some of these new systems will automatically navigate and fly an interceptor from the moment it leaves the ground until it returns to its base. Equally significant, some systems will fire a new type of armament, the Falcon air-to-air -air guided missile. The Falcon guided missile was also developed by the Hughes Aircraft Company and is currently being manufactured by the company at an Air Force plant in Tucson, Arizona. The Falcon will be an important air-to-air -air armament of the Air Defense Command. It contains a highly explosive charge and is small enough to be carried in quantities by almost any interceptor. Electronic equipment in the missile, seen here on a field checkout stand, enables the Falcon to see its target and to steer itself to correct its trajectory errors. As a result, it can be launched from far beyond the range of a bomber's defensive armament, and it can hit the bomber despite any evasive maneuvers. For these test firings, the explosive charge was removed from the missiles. Nonetheless, damage to the drone targets was severe and frequently the drones were brought down by the unarmed missiles. For firing Falcon missiles, the new electronic systems being developed for the all-weather interceptor will perform the same basic functions as for firing rockets. Locate the target by radar, fly the interceptor on a straight line course for attacking it, and